we set out to prove that it was safe. Yeah. Uh, whether or not that's why we got funded, I mean, that, that's irrelevant. But the way we designed the experiment was simply to collect hip bones from uh, people that were donating their hips during total hip implant surgery, compare the uh, bone samples that we retrieved from people in Montreal, where uh, Montreal is not fluoridated, never has been fluoridated, compare that to the Torontonians, Mount Sinai Hospital, we now have compared about 60 samples. It turns out that uh, the, the Montreal bone samples have a very uh, small variation in terms of their fluoride content and uh, hover around 200 parts per million. The variation in the Torontonian hip samples is tremendous. It, it varies from 200 up to 2,500 parts per million. Um, we're now looking at uh, just looking at one disease entity, osteoarthritis, factoring in all of the age uh, effects, etc., and um, not even looking at Toronto versus Montreal, just simply looking at the fluoride content. Okay. Now we have done that. What we have done now is to look at the fluoride content in the same type of bone, and we've discovered actually, or Debbie, who is a PhD student, Debbie Chashra, has discovered that there's a direct correlation between the fluoride content and the architecture of the bone. In other words, fluoride just from water fluoridation exposure, because we presume that the Montrealers and Torontonians have had the same amount of toothpaste exposure. Mm -hmm. In Canada, toothpaste, fluoridated toothpaste was, was introduced in the same, the same time. Um, we now believe that, that the little bit of fluoride that's been incorporated into their bone uh, has affected their architecture. Now, whether that's positive or negative, we haven't got enough data yet to show. And the abstracts that we've published so far at the international meetings uh, basically report these findings, that uh, there are differences between Toronto and Montreal, uh, that we, we are seeing effect of fluoridated water on the architecture of the bone, whether or not this makes the bone slightly stronger or, or slightly weaker, we don't know yet. We do know from animal studies that the uh, strength of the bone actually starts to decline the more fluoride you have in the bone. The fluoride makes the bone more brittle because the crystals are packed tighter and these crystals actually make the bone like a crystal, like a you know, more, more uh, easily fractured uh, crystal and therefore a bone that's rich in fluorapatite or fluoride will break more easily. It's more brittle. And, and that, that would appear to be consistent with these eight studies mm -hmm. on hip fracture. Yeah. Well, it, it, the increase in fluoride that these people in the states have been exposed to from just water fluoridation may have contributed to the brittleness of their bone. Because the longer you live, obviously, the more fluoride you accumulate into your bone. And if you build up enough fluoride in your bone from the fluoride in the water, you may end up uh, with bone that's slightly more brittle than, than average. And of course, we're concerned about hip fractures uh, because that's a huge cost to the healthcare system. Um, you know, studies show that, that it's devastating to these people, uh, especially uh, the old ladies, uh, mostly women that are affected by this, end up in wheelchairs and some don't live through the, uh, uh, the ordeal, they end up in nursing homes. There's been a study now um, saying that women uh, would rather die than have a hip fracture because of the uh, the prospect of being in a nursing home in a wheelchair afterwards. So this is a huge issue that we should be addressing and we should be looking very carefully at uh, what we're doing to our bodies, you know, everybody's body. We're, so far, Torontonians have only been exposed for 30 or 35 years to fluoridated water. What's going to happen in 60 years? You know, uh, we're seeing patients with 2,500 parts per million fluoride in their, in their bone. You don't see that in Montreal. So what's going to happen 30 years from now when people are 70 years old with 60 years of uh, fluoridated water exposure? If we continue to, to expose our population to the level of fluoride that they're exposed to now, there's no question in my mind that we're going to see uh, bone problems, severe bone problems, uh, further down the road, 30 years from now. No question about it.
about this notion of things around the bone? I guess arthritis, the joints. What what is, what is this this concern? Could fluoride be yeah. interfering with the materials around the bone? It's well known in the endemic fluorosis areas that the first sign of skeletal fluorosis is aching joints. Fluoride deposits actually in the joints, uh, in the soft parts of the joints, the tendons and the uh, cartilage. And that fluoride de deposition uh, results in real achy joints. Nobody, to my knowledge, has yet looked carefully at fluoridated cities um, or fluoridated populations and looked at the symptoms of arthritis to determine whether or not fluoride as, is contributing to this uh, endemic or, or possibly uh, epidemic of arthritis that we have in North America. Could you give us some more, any other concerns that you have? We talked about teeth and we talked about bones. What about beyond bones? Uh, I'm quite concerned because I'm, I'm now learning the chemistry uh, behind fluoride mechanisms in its toxicology. And it's quite possible that fluoride, even at low levels, um, could affect essential mechanisms such as the cyclic AMP second messenger. Uh, fluoride is a known activator of G protein. And we figure, or some people figure, that uh, fluoride could be affecting all kinds of cellular metabolism uh, through this G-protein mechanism. Um, I'm concerned about the, the effect of fluoride on thyroid tissue. I'm concerned about the effect of fluoride on a number of other tissues. We've learned now that it accumulates in the pineal gland, that it may be affecting melatonin production. Um, I'm concerned about uh, reproductive organs and its effect on reproductive organs. There's lots of animal studies to show that at higher doses it, uh, it's devastating to the animal's reproductive uh, systems. Um, so, you know, there are some studies that are coming out now looking at human beings in, you know, fluoridated cities where there's been 30, 40, 50 years of water fluoridation. We should be doing studies. We should be carefully looking at the effects of fluoride level exposures and the uh, soft tissue effects. How has the dental community responded to this latest research and the things that you've mentioned, the pineal gland and the, uh, the G proteins and uh, the, other, the other studies that you mentioned? I can tell you that there's nothing in the literature that they would have read about the toxicology of fluoride. The journal fluoride is not even in our dental library. I've now um, uh, made sure, uh, thanks to the generosity of uh, the International Society for Fluoride Research, they're going to send us the uh, journal uh, back issues to put in our library. Uh, the dental community has no idea of the toxicology behind fluoride. Uh, the environmental issues uh, is news to them. We, we really have to do our, our job to educate the dental community on the possible harmful effects of fluoride. But we often get um, either dentists or representative, representatives of the American Dental Association going in front of the public saying there is no debate, there is no scientific debate, there is no evidence of any harmful effects. Where are these statements coming from? It's based on years and years of circular arguments. You know, when, when 30 years ago they decided to uh, do reviews uh, of, of the safety of fluoride, they didn't do the research, they didn't look for the harmful effects, therefore they didn't exist. The harmful effects that didn't exist, it's a circular argument. So they're ignoring more recent data that's coming up now with uh, evidence that it may be harmful in in even smaller doses that we had assumed. Uh, and they keep coming back to the, you know, the basic argument that it's safe because we don't see any evidence of harm. Just about um, nearly two years ago, I had the enormous pleasure to interview the late Dr. John Cahoon in New Zealand. And when we got to the topic of osteosarcoma, he said that he knew parents of children who died from osteosarcoma. The people responsible for the health care system should look at the total risk benefit and make a decision. If they actually start making estimates on the 
cost to the healthcare system, even if there you know, is a, an underestimate of the hip fractures, if there's an underestimate of the bone cancers, if there's an underestimate of the hypothyroidism resulting from fluoride interference with iodine and thyroid function, an underestimation of the uh, reproductive effects, if you even make those calculations and add that to the equation of dental fluorosis, it's quite clear that the benefits do not outweigh the risks. The risks are far too high. If I was to uh, provide fluoride to a patient in this dental chair and not inform them about the risks involved in swallowing this fluoride, if they take this fluoride uh, toothpaste home, now there's warning labels on the toothpaste, but if I give a special formulation uh, to patients and I say, take this home and use it, it's going to prevent dental decay. If I don't provide warnings and discuss the precautions and the harmful side effects that might occur when you swallow this stuff, I could be sued in, civil law, uh, uh, in a civil law court for not per getting informed consent. Cities have never obtained informed consent from their residents after putting, or before putting fluoride in the water supply. Why is it difficult to, to get people dentists, doctors, and others to even look at this issue? I think because the national governmental organizations have publicly stated they want fluoride in the water to protect people from dental disease. You have to, con you have to completely turn around 180 degrees organizations like the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta. The American Dental Association, the National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research, the NIDCR, uh, which is an uh, institute from the National Institute of Health. The public health associations recommend fluoride in the water. Everybody still recommends fluoride in the water. We have to eat away at each and every single organization and convince them that they're in the wrong position, that it can no longer be supported, possibly even legally. Uh, if there's enough evidence of damage, we may be in a situation to, uh, to encourage people to, to speak out and use legal means to stop fluoridation. Because if they're being damaged without informed consent, without providing informed consent, they have a good legal basis to start a class action lawsuit. Now, I don't want to take that approach. I think education is probably the best approach. But unless they change their minds in the next few years based on the current evidence, I think it's time for litigation.